I think we're ready to go, aren't we? Yeah, I think that's about time. I think my my computer clock has just clicked over, so I think we'll call we'll call that start. Uh, good morning. Uh, we at the moment have um, we've got eight participants um, at the moment, but it may grow. Uh, I'm Jeff Godin. Um, I look after membership and the forum for my sins on uh, the uh, guild. Um, and I'd like to introduce you to one of our live Zoom sessions, Nick Dunhill, who is vastly more proficient than me at making and crafting anything. Um, I'm a bit of a ready to run person, but I have built a loco in the past. Um, in terms of uh, protocols, um, if we will, or you can yourself, uh, mute yourselves, please. I will be able to see, I'll have a list of participants so I can see who's here. If you want to raise a question during Nick's demonstrations, if he's doing something in particular that needs asking about it at that point in time, say something in chat um, and I will uh, alert Nick to it. And uh, we will, if it's a, a live question, we'll ask you maybe to unmute and just raise your question. We'll certainly have a question and answer session at the end, uh, but we don't want to sort of in terms of continuity, we don't want to break it up too much by a sort of volleys of different questions, um, often over the top <laughs> of the bladder. So um, I will stay unmuted, but I'll keep my mouth shut <laughs> as far as possible. Um, but if you will all mute yourselves. Um, and Nick, would you like to take us away? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's play trains. Mm. Um, well, I'm going to make a boiler for you this morning. Um, I'm going to make it from um, some brass formers that I've already pre-cut out and the nickel silver wrapper that I'll tell you a little bit more about in a minute. And this is kind of a follow on to a video I did a few weeks ago, which was uh, an evening with Nick Dunhill. And, and in that um, presentation, I demonstrated how to build a smoke box um, using a very, very similar method to this. Um, and I suppose this is just an extension of that where, where um, I build the boiler. And if we've got time at the end as well, I'll take you through forming the firebox as well. Um, right, I'm going to switch you over because I've got an overhead camera here uh, and you'll be able to see, hopefully, um, the rolling bars and so on. There we go. Just to show that I'm still there, I'll switch on an extra light as well so I can see what I'm up to. So, I'll let the light out of shot. There we go. Right, as I said earlier, I've pre cut a couple of farmers. Now, these have been um, pre cut from a 0.45 millimeter brass. Um, I think I don't know what that is in foul. I don't really work in foul. But anyway, they've been pre-cut. They're just very simply um, scarred with a, um, a compass that I've got that's got a scalpel blade instead of a, um, a pencil. Um, and obviously, I took the diameter of these farmers from the GA. I've got the GA of the boiler that I'm building this morning there, look. And, and this is a Hull and Barnsley Railway 240. Um, I'm going to be building this section here, the boiler, this morning. And if I've got a little bit of time, I'll show you something about the firebox as well. In the earlier video, I built the smoke box, which was this bit. Can you see it? So that's the profile of it up front. But it's very straightforward. Basically, you measure the diameter of the boiler, that you, the finished boiler that you need, and subtract a couple of thicknesses of material for the wrapper because the farmers are going to go inside the, the wrapper. And then you just cut yourself a, a circle. Now that's the farmer that I'm going to use for the uh, front of the boiler. And I've soldered that onto a piece of uh, brass sheet and cut out the other farmer. And I made a hole in the farmer so you can get stuff in to the um, boiler through the hole. You might want to get a, a DCC decoder or some lead ballast or something like that. So they're the farmers, they're cut out of 0.45. I think it's 15 fell. You can tell me later if I'm wrong. Sure I am, I don't do imperials. This is the wrapper. Um, and, and quite simply, that's pi times diameter. One dimension, which is this dimension here along the top or the bottom, is pi times the diameter 
of the former. And this dimension is, is, is simply the length of the boiler that I, uh, I want to form. And this, is, this, this has been cut out of um, 0.3, I think it's 0.3 millimetre nickel silver. I kind of like making the wrappers, yes it is, it's 0.3. I kind of like making the wrappers out of much thinner material than you would normally get in a commercial kit. Use, often in the commercial kit you'll get uh, a rectangle like this that's been pre-etched um, and sometimes pre-rolled as well. Um, but they're always in 0.45. And I always think that these kind of hobbyists, slip rollers, struggle a little bit to do um, uh, 0.45 material. So to get a nice cylinder, I always choose 0.3, which might seem a bit thin. But obviously, once it's been rolled into a tube, it's got quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of strength introduced into it. Right, so these are my handy slip rollers that I got off eBay years ago. Um, and we've got three rollers that are arranged in a, a sort of a triangle to each other. If I tilt them, you can see we've got these two rollers are called pinch rollers, and they work a little bit like a, an old fashioned mangle on an old fashioned washing machine where they just grip the material and feed it through. And then here um, we have what's called the, the uh, farm roller. And, and there are two adjustment things here that allow me to move the, the farm roller up and down in a, a diagonal slot just there that you can see. Um, and they just deflect the material as it comes through the pinch rollers and gradually roll it up into a cylinder, as I will demonstrate. Right, so the first thing to do really is to, um, well, the, this isn't a definitive way of doing it. This is the way I always do it. And I'm not a professional engineer. And I've just made all this up as I'm going along. Um, but the problem with pinch rollers like this is that when you get towards the end of the farm session, you'll see that the uh, end piece of the material flips out of the uh, pinch rollers. And so it's, it will not form the last section. Of the, uh, of the piece of material. It won't roll it into a cylinder because it's left the pinch rollers. So the thing to do is to form that, that part first. And I do that by putting the uh, material through the form rollers the wrong way. They should go, the material should go in that way through the pinch rollers to be deflected by the form roller. But to get an initial curve, I'm going to push them through backwards like so. So, that's the, uh, the materials now into the roller. And as you can see, I've formed a curve in the end of it. And I'm just going to check. And it, it, as you can see, it does match the farmer. So that's that bit So I'm Just going to release a bit of the tension from the farm roller and then we'll... So what I'm doing now is I'm putting the material back through the roller curved end last if you remember that the uh, that will click out of the pinch rollers before the all of the material's gone through so let me show you how we do this we're going to do three or four passes and we need to turn the handle in an even way that's the first pass as you can see we've started to put some shape into the sheet and now i'm going to move the farm roller up a little bit. There we go. Keeping it parallel to the pinch rollers, and we're going to put it, the material back through again. And you can see now straight away that the material now has got an even bigger curve in it. Great. So now I've got to move the form roller up a little bit more. And we'll go for a third pass. There it goes. And I think we're getting quite close now, as you can see, with each pass, we get closer and closer to having a cylinder. So one more should do it if I roll the form roller up a little bit more. 
And there we have it. We have a cylinder. Right, so we're finished with that. So get rid of that. And now we will take some copper wire to wire the whole structure together before I can solder it. Now, I'm using copper wire, but actually things like cable ties work quite well for this little plastic electrical cable ties. Um, they have a slight disadvantage though in that they uh, can't really be uh, reused. So, as you can see, what I'm doing there is wrapping some copper wire around the Boiler, tightening it up, put another one around the uh, other end of the tube, like so. Now, this is the bit where I find out whether my measurements were accurate. What I'm pitching for here, obviously, is a piece of material that's exactly the right diameter for the farmers. But almost inevitable, almost inevitably, it'll be a bit too long. So the, the seam will overlap. Um, the worst scenario, obviously, <laughs> if I've made it too short. So I've dropped, this is just a flat piece of nickel, of uh, aluminium that I use for building things on. Um, so I've dropped the uh, former into the bottom there. I'm just going to grab a pair of pliers and tighten up the... Uh, bottom piece of copper wire. And as you can see, I've actually made the wrapper very, very, very fractionally too long. So, pop the other farmer in the other end. Tighten that up. So, so the, the tube's now quite tight around the farmer at the top and the farmer at the bottom. And the wrapper is now overlapped on itself there. So, I find a scalpel. I can now score a line where I need to cut the wrapper. So, so we'll take those off. Another, you probably won't be able to see, but I can just see a very faint line there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the grinder and just remove a very small portion of brass. From the wrapper there. Start the process again. We'll drop a drop a wrapper. Better loosen this first. Drop a piece of wire. farmer back inside. You can see I've actually put one with a hole in the bottom this time. Turn this up again. So that's nice and tight and holding the farmer in the end of the, the tube. Pop that in there. Turn the whole thing upside down. Use a blunt thingy to push the farmer into the bottom of the tube. 
and then the time this piece of wire so that's nicely gripping the uh, the end of there. And do you know what? That is still no, I think that's perfect. Then. So now we've got the uh, no, we haven't. Let's take it out. Just whiz a little bit more off the length of the. Uh, Wrap a little bit more so we've got a nice foot joint and they're not overlapping. There we go. Right, let's try for a third time. Farmer in the bottom, tamp it down. Nice butt joint around there. Just pop the farmer in the bottom. Press that down into the bottom, like so. Make sure that the, uh, the alignment's right there and there, and that the farmer's flush with the end, which it is. I'm happy with that. And just tighten this up. One last time, and then we can go for some soldering. Yeah, happy with that. Happy with that. And one last time. So now we'll uh, we'll tack it. I'm just going to start by putting a, a tack just there. Now I'm going to use electrical solder for this. Often people use one four five for this. Which is probably fine, but I'm just going to use electrical solar because it'll just give me a little bit more strength. So this is just normal electrical multi-core solar that I'm using. I'm just going to tack it there. And tack the farmer in place. Just there. So it doesn't fall out. Same at the other end. We'll tap the farmer into place. Just using a phosphoric acid liquid flux here. That's the farmer tacked into place. And I just want to put a little tack just there with electrical solder along the seam of the board. Just like so. Excellent. Right, so we'll go back, just join up these tacks now and just solder the end. Farmer. Now we've uh, got the structural integrity of the thing. That's uh, the rear farmer in place. Let's do put some flux on there and do the front farmer.
There we go. Now we'll uh, solder along the seam. So just put a tack in the middle. Just to hold the seam in the middle there. And then we'll work our way along the seam now with uh, plenty of liquid flux. Some nice heat from the soldier. Right? Slightly. So here. Just try to manipulate the uh, join at the same time so that they're nicely butted together. And there we have it, my claim success. Take the uh, copper wire off now. Just finish that little bit there that was underneath the wire. So they're just there too. There we go. There we have it. One. Nice boiler tube. All nicely soldered up. And to clean it up, I'm going to use me, uh, what I've got here is a sanding disc my mini drill and I'm just going to go around around the end like that get all the excess solder off same around the other end <clears throat> and then I've got a quite a coarse file here just for roughing the uh, the seam, getting all the big, big, big blobby bits of uh, solder off. finish this off using my uh, sanding disc going across the, the seam just removing all the excess solder finishing the, uh, the join quite nicely along the bottom Thank you. 
to hand here just to finish that off. It needs a little bit of a uh, little bit more filing along the bottom, but you don't want to sit there for another 15 minutes watching me uh, finish off the bottom of the boiler. But essentially, that's it ready for boiler bands and uh, everything else. Now, as I uh, said earlier, these are the these are the these are the copper ties that I use. I'm going to put those to one side because they can be really useful for uh, pipe work inside a cap on the back head, that kind of thing. They're uh, pretty nice for that kind of thing. So we'll just put those to one side and recycle them. Um, what I've actually made here is this section of the boiler from mm. the small box to the fire box. You can see it's a little bit longer than the um, drawing. The drawing actually comes out very slightly on the scale. You have to take a measurement off this and times it by uh, 1.06 to get some of the scale. Although this is a PDF that someone sent to me when it prints out, they tend to print out very slightly too small. Anyway, that, that's that bit of the, of the boiler. As I, as I said earlier, I demonstrated how to make the firebox. Uh, in a previous An Evening with Nick Dunhill presentation a couple of uh, weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago, actually. Now. So we've already got that part. This is that part. Um, now, sometimes in commercial kits, um, the etching that you get for rolling into a boiler will be a bit longer and it'll include some material for the firebox. Um, but I kind of don't like doing it this way, that way around, because um, once you've got to this stage, obviously, then you have to measure the length of your firebox and then cut along the bottom there and up the sides and then start teasing out the part of the boiler then to form the, 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 the firebox sides. Now, that's not always, in my kind of experience, a very easy thing to do. Sometimes the boiler is quite a small diameter and, and the firebox is quite tall. So there physically isn't enough material here to unfurl to form the sides of the firebox. So what I always tend to do is make the firebox separately. And in the finest sort of blue peach traditions, here's one I made earlier. That's um, just another circle same diameter as this and then making an estimate of the width of the bottom of the firebox using the dimension across the back head there transferring that dimension here and the height as well the height from the height from there onto this so you get two keyhole formers then and a rectangular one for the bottom that is the right length and the right width. So then obviously you uh, can join the 
firebox to the boiler in that way. And then you get something with, you know, quite neat sides that haven't had to be forced to form this reverse curve, having already been bent in the other direction. The wrapper for this is obviously a rectangle about so big, but because it's only narrow, it's possible to form it around a, a, a steel bar. You don't have to use the slip rollers for doing this. You can, because it's only, only made out of 0.3 millimeter thick material, you can just form this by hand, just by very carefully wrapping it around. I've got a few of various size bars. This one's very good for the forming the main curve there. And then the smaller one's very good for just popping in there and forming the, uh, the return. Or a drill shank is probably long enough to do that as well, if you haven't got any bars. So uh, that's how I would complete the boiler then, by making a, a, a firebox like this, using the method in my previous video. And then they can be joined like so. Um, a good way of doing this actually is to get some masking tape and just tape around there as much as you can to get the joint as flush as possible. And then of course, when you solder a boiler band around the joint, the joint becomes invisible anyway. But there we go, 30 minutes. How to make a boiler in 30 minutes. Of course, it did take several hours to cut pieces of material out, but there you are. Does anybody have any questions? Um, Nick, I'll take um, co chair's privilege and ask you the first one. So, on, suppose you have bought this in a kit, and unfortunately, your boiler incorporates the firebox as well. Um, are you suggesting, in a sense, you sort of go to the edge, and assume it's a flat edge at this stage, and separate the firebox bit from the boiler bit, and as you've done, treat them separately? Or Absolutely, you, that's how I'd do it. Yeah, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't try and make the best of a, a, a bad design. I mean, it depends. If you're making a tank engine, then this bit really doesn't matter because you can't see it. It's behind the tanks anyway, so you could make the the whole thing the full length and not even bother farming next day. And then you're just doing a cutout for the motor, presumably. And then you just need to cut a piece out of the bottom of the boiler somewhere around here yeah. to accommodate yeah. the motor or whatever else you know you want to get inside. Because obviously sometimes you want to get bits of lead inside there or a DCC decoder or a, I don't know, a speaker or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, but if it's um, some sometimes sometimes you get lucky and you get a, a normal tender engine that, that might have a lot of detail just here. You know, sometimes they have a cross tube fitting, or maybe they'll have lots of pipe work like on standard logos perhaps that goes across here. And if that were the case, I might take a punt at trying to form this. It is quite difficult, as you could as you can see. Um, there is probably just about enough material in the boiler actually to slit it up there and start trying to tease it out to form the firebox side if it were long enough. Um, but um, but actually, you know, this you get a much neater job doing it doing it like this because you're not having to form material that's already gone in one direction. It's much more difficult to tease it back out. The reverse curve there once it's already been it's very difficult to get this bit straight if it needs to be straight um if it's already been curved so i know it's a, i know it's a lot of extra effort but this is why this is how i would always do it is just to make the the three components separate um and you get a much better i think you get a much better job that way around it's a lot more work though obviously it's a lot more work typically the kits only come with a couple of farmers um, and sometimes you just have to take the farmers that are in the kit and solder them onto some um, you know a sheet of, of brass or nickel silver and just cut out um, some more farmers that match um, and sometimes it's a good idea to mark where the top edge is sometimes I'll score a plate join along the um, wrapper before I start folding it although um, you need to be very careful that you don't scar it too deeply because that will tend to happen when you're folding the, the material in the slip rollers. It'll try to fold rather than mm. rock. 
So, but anyway, yeah, that's um, that's how I would always do it. And then make sure the seams at the bottom, obviously, because that's the uh, very slightly unsightly bit. Although it won't be by the time uh, I've packed away all this lighting, because obviously I'm going to see you when the presentation's <laughs> over and, uh, and 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 tidy all this up, make it all nice and uh, smooth. Anybody else? Any questions? I've yeah. Uh, now we've got 18 viewers and four of you are sort of visual, but that's only four of you can raise your hands <laughs> so you can ask a question. In the first instance, just to cover for the ones that aren't visual at the moment, if you want to ask a question, and now it's, given our numbers, it's good best if you ask it directly. Um, will you just sort of go to the chat box and just literally put your name? I'll see your name and then I'll invite you to unmute and you can ask your question. Anybody coming up in the chat box? Just, just put your surname or Oh, right. James. Um, James, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Uh, yeah. Hi, Ed. Nick, Hello. what do you do um, in terms of how to cut out? You mentioned like there's several hours of cutting out, but what's involved with that and what tools do you use and so on? Well, I've got um, some compasses here that uh, you can see they've got a pointer and they've got a, a sort of a scalpel. I, th I think this is a tool that graphic artists use for cutting out things, uh, but it's really good actually for scoring on, on a metal sheet. And I, <clears throat> over here in the corner of your workshop, I've just got a a selection of, of just sheets of nickel silver that are all of various thickness and you can see there where I've cut a, a farmer out of this one and it's just simply a case of um, squaring up the corners you have to square up the corners of the sheet don't assume that the sheets have been cut into a square because often they haven't or almost always they haven't so you're going to need you're going to need one of these to square and um, Good place to start is to make a two edges of the sheet that are perpendicular to each other using the square, and then you can mark out the uh, rectangle, for instance, that you need for the wrapper. Now, I always do it the shabby person's way by dialing up the measurement that I need on my uh, vernier and just scoring a line along like that, which is a you know a very poor way of doing it. I can see all the engineers there on the screen shuddering at the thought of using a vernier as a as a marking out tool, but that will scribe a line. And then there is no secret. You use one of these, I'm afraid, a piercing saw with a six knot blade in it, and you sit there and cut it out. And it's uh, it's kind of as simple as that then. Once you've cut it out roughly to the line, then uh, got a selection of little needle files here that I use just to finish it off. Although sometimes I cheat. I, I learned that um, this is kind of a very cheap mini drill that I've had for donkey shoes. And um, Minicraft sells a little um, rubber cup that you can attach to the, into the chuck that you, you can stick uh, sanding discs Onto the onto the rubber harbor, the rubber harbor there, um, and I cut these out, these discs out. I cut these out from just from wet and dry paper with double sided tape stuck on the back, and they're really fabulous for you know for filing things very quickly. You can quite quickly cut your circles, make your circles, cut them down to the line by just going around the edge, you know, with the uh, sanding disc. I recommend one of those. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're very, very useful tools to have. Um, but basically, everything's just hand cut out of nickel silver sheet like this. There's no secret to it, I'm afraid. Just kind of, you just kind of lift your measurements off the GA, mark it out on the nickel silver sheet over there, and um, and then you cut it out very carefully with a piercing saw. And all the time checking that if it's a rectangle, that all the corners are square as well. They need to be, you know, to a, a you know, a, a, a point one of a millimetre at least. 
to get to get the accuracy for a for a, a nice rectangle that you can then roll up into a performer. Great, thank you. So I wish there were a, I wish there were a magic way of doing it, you know, a magic machine that cut cut these pieces out, but in reality there isn't. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, come on, just bang your name into the chat and I'll, I'll, I'll call you up, please. Michael, you're waving something. Do you want to say something, Michael Holland? Unmute yourself. That's it. Um, yeah, marking out a um, pair of dividers, uh, far more durable than, um, than using the, the vernier and set them from the vernier anyway. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is the line's easy to see if you use one of these magic gut or permanent markers. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I did, did do that in the past. You know, I had, used to have a marker pen here, look, but um, it's dried out. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. It. And it's very good, isn't it, just for colouring in the sheet along the line. That's right. Mm, mm. Well, my eyes and aren't as good as they used to be, so... Yeah, yeah. But uh, the, the important thing is, is just is just accuracy. And it's a good idea yeah. if, if you cut the um, wrapper very slightly over length in this dimension. Mm. Because um, as I showed you right at the beginning, it's very easy to slit a piece yes. off yeah. the, uh, the wrapper if it's slightly mm. too long. But I've got lots and lots of tools here that I can use for removing material, but not very many that I've got that will put material back on, I'm afraid. Oh, and the other thing I should have mentioned was that what what, what I sometimes do, if, if the boil is very, very long, and I think I need a little bit of extra stiffness, I sometimes get a bit of scrap, a scrap strip of brass and just solder it down the seam along the inside, you know, just try and manipulate your soldering iron in there, to try and tack a piece of, um, tack a piece of thin brass strip along the seam. And then when you solder in from the, the bottom, then um, hopefully the solder then runs into the piece of strip that you've tacked inside. And that will give you a bit of extra strength to your joint if you, you, know, if you feel that you need that. Um, perhaps you might on a boiler that's a bit longer than this one, or maybe one that's a smaller diameter where the, um, the wrappers are you know, trying to fight against you. It's trying to spring away all the time. Uh, nickel silver can be a bit like that. It's, um, it's a bit more springy. There is a proper engineering word for that, isn't there? That isn't springy. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's much more springy than brass. Um, swings and roundabouts, really. Some materials. Brass is good for some things. Nickel silver, good for others. Um. I think Brian Norris has got a question. Brian, can you unmute yourself? Right away, Brian. Hey there. Oh, yeah, it was just a, a sorry, quick question about um, the wattage of your iron. I missed the beginning of your presentation, so I'm sorry if that's uh, the question that's already been asked. Oh. Did you see me roll up the... Uh... No, I, I only came in about a quarter of an hour ago. Oh, right, okay. Um, well, these are my slip rollers here, look. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the question yeah. was, what wattage of iron are you using to yeah. your solder? Oh, the iron, Nick. Oh, the soldering iron. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've got, I've got one of these. It's um, it's a Ursa icon. I've got to try and move me. There it is. Look, can you see that? Oh, yeah. Just here. It's, a, it's an Ursa icon soldering iron it's kind of a commercial uh, soldering iron they're hideously expensive i think it was about 450 quid but i um but i do this every day you know it's my job <laughs> and um so i i it's on for eight hours a day for five days a week some people will tell you you know you need a, a 20 watt iron and some people will say oh no you need an 80 watt iron i wonder what what it you well I, I i do have um Another soldering iron here in the corner of the workshop that I inherited off my wife when she gave up um, doing stained glass windows. And this is just a cheap Antex thing that came from, uh, um, came from Maplings, actually, when Maplings used to exist. And you can see this is a 100 watt soldering iron and the tip here is quite hefty. 
Um, and I very occasionally get this out for soldering up um, things like crank axles, you know, when you're soldering the crank webbing onto a, a steel um, axle. Um, because you can get a lot of heat very quickly into the, into the workpiece, which is important if you're trying to solder, you know, say a brass casting onto a steel axle, you know, you need to get the heat in there quickly before the uh, baker's fluid flux kind of starts to decompose everything. Um, but these um, Ursa soldering irons, you can get different tips. And if you get quite a big chisel tip, for these, and they are, again, the tip's fairly expensive. Um, you know, they do do quite good heat transfer. Obviously there's a limit to the amount of current that the, that the power station over there is kicking out, uh, the, the um, sorry, the power supply for it's kicking out. But I find for most things, these little um, Ursa soldering lines are pretty good. They are pretty good. Um, and they do maintain the temperature quite well. Um, but this is, this is, you know, I do have this as a backup just in case, you know, just for soldering things when they start to get a bit hefty. Um, okay. okay. I don't use it very often. This is just, it is just a cheap soldering iron that came from Maplins. It doesn't exist anymore, Maplins, does it? I think no. and also in Sheffield, there used to be a, a famous independent place called Bardwells, which was a bit like um, Maplins, you know, so it would sell you a resistor or, you know, a capacitor, that kind of place. And you used to be able to get soldering irons there for next to nothing. And they weren't bad, they weren't bad value. You know, they lasted a few few months before the um, soldering iron tip gave out on you and then you had to go and buy another one. But since I bought the professional quality one, really, I have to say I've not looked back. And it is a bit of an investment if you're just a hobbyist. Yeah. Uh, Nick, James asked, I'll, I'll ask on his behalf on this occasion, um, where would you get a set of rolling? I mean, you said you picked those up on eBay. I mean, those are, these up off eBay. Um, <laughs> They're not always uh, there. <laughs> not always available on eBay. No, I appreciate that. There's a, there's a fella who's um, called Dave Smith, who's um, a Guild member, who has a company called the Midland Railway Centre. And he made, he makes these. And in fact, he made these because they've got a Midland Railway sticker on them just there. Like mm. um, I can't remember how much they are. They're about 100 quid, something like that. Um, but they're really useful. And again, you know, I, you know, I probably roll a boiler every couple of weeks. So I really do need some slip rollers. I don't have many tools. I've got some slip rollers and I've got a machine that embosses rivets. Uh, and I've got a little pedestal drill here, and that's it. I don't have a lathe or a milling machine or anything like that. Everything else I do, I can, I've kind of learned how to form by hand or bending them around, you know, machine blocks like this. But that's uh, kind of how I do it. But, yeah, these are the rollers that I use. They're, they're very good. They're um, slip rollers. They've got, as I was explaining to everybody earlier, they've got pair of rollers here that pinch the sheets as it goes through and then a farm roller that deflects the material as it goes up through the pinch rollers and you do several passes of the sheet and eventually you uh, by tightening by moving the farm roller upwards eventually the flat piece turns into a cylinder and that's how we did it earlier but unfortunately that part of the demonstration really only lasted a few minutes it's quite a quick process yeah uh, yeah, I mean, it's always also worth if you're a guild member keeping an eye on the uh, sort of guild sales. I mean, yeah, yeah. In inevitably, you know, people will dispose of the contents of their tool room every so often, and um, these may come up within that. Yes, um, yeah. I, I used to borrow one off a club member here in Sheffield, the Sheffield Ogage Group, and he, mm. got really, he got really annoyed with me borrowing them all the time. So he told me, <laughs> he, sent me an, he sent me an email one day saying, some on eBay, please go and buy it. <laughs> yes, I suppose if you overuse the hospitality, yeah, I, I did. That's a good, that's a good push for actually joining. Yeah, my local club, I'm sure if I needed to, in fact, I think they've got lathes, milling machines, and all sorts of things I could yeah, yeah. put my hand on, but certainly a set of rolling bars I could borrow off the club if I, if yeah. I needed to. Well, I would say, I would say rolling bars are like the fourth or fifth most important part of the equipment that I've got. I mean, they were quite rusty when I got them, and also somebody had been using them to. Uh, 
hammer pieces of it because they've mm. got little dings and marks in them. Oh, no. I had to dress out because uh, otherwise those marks are reproduced in the thing that you're forming as well. So Faithfully, yeah. Uh... Oh, God. Somebody had put, put brass over it and hammered it, you know, tried to hammer it around. Yes. So, Some people uh, shouldn't be allowed near tools, should they? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not, it's not innate knowledge, is it, out to you? But if you, go to, if you go to YouTube, there are plenty of uh, bits of video of uh, people demonstrating, you know, how to use even massive, you know, in huge industrial size ones, you know, that are rolling up. You know, piece from I don't know three quarter inch steel plate into a diameter of several feet. That's always yeah. worth watching. You know, watching. Yeah. So Nick, Nick, I'll, I'll, I'll ask another question. Oh, yeah, sorry, right. Michael's got a question here. Michael, come in again. Unmute yourself. There I was you forgetting to do that bit. Um, what I think is the advantage of um, Nick using. Uh, only 0.3 material for for rolling his boilers is that there's far less chance of distortion along the uh, the boiler when he's rolling it because if you tend to use a thicker material what can in fact happen is that the rollers can flex um, between the ends and therefore if you're not careful you roll a tapered boiler when you don't want to yeah. um, and obviously the thinner material the less the risk um, yeah. of that happening because there's less force on the rollers themselves. Even even using, you're absolutely right, Michael, even using material like this, even mm. using concrete, it's still, the slip rollers still roll it much more around the edges and a bit yes. less in the middle. Yeah. Because, I mean, what you might have seen me do was move the, um, move the, the bands that were holding the thing, moving them yeah. into one, yeah. into mm. a boiler as you solder. I mean, it wasn't such a problem on this because it's only a sharp thing. But um, mm. you, you, if you if you move if you if you move the, the the wire or the cable tie that you're binding it with, if you just hutch it in slightly as you solder in, then you, it, yeah, it, it yeah, brings yeah. Up together for you. And and that's always a problem with slip rollers. And you're right, the thicker the material, um, and the longer the piece as well, the the more it will distort mm. the slip mm. roller. And you need, and for, for, for forming a tube that's this diameter, you need a piece, you need rollers that have got quite small diameter rollers in them. You know, industrial yeah. ones, got huge rollers, you know, that are as big as your car tyre. But, um, you know, obviously the thinner the thinner the roller, the more distortion you'll get from it. But the, the, the ones from uh, Midland, and the, there are other slip rollers available, but the one that Smithy sells from um, the Midland, uh, railway centre. Uh, I've never had a problem with them at all. You know, they've been absolutely fine for all the boilers that I've ever rolled, even for quite big ones for Pacifics and things. You know. Well, mine was a, an old um, one that I bought donkeys years ago from. Um, I think it was called a Bristone or something of, of that sort, which was from a firm somewhere down Luton Way, right. and that doesn't have quite the same sophisticated adjustments that yours have. Right. Um, and therefore, it is a little bit more difficult to to set up properly. Yeah. So. Well, the, the, these these rollers have got the, the pinch rollers have got adjustments, so you can grab yeah. all different thicknesses of material to feed it through. And then the the, the farm roller, you can move. Yeah. Um, but I, I find that if um, if you start using really thick, try to get ambitious and try to roll sort of point eight, shall we say. Yeah, through the slip rollers, There's the, the the diameter of the the, the, the rods are, are just too too big to be able to deflect material that's very thin. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Mm. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a bit of an issue. But the good thing about these slip rollers, as well, is that they have adjustment to either ends of the pinch rollers. So if, yes. you, yeah. if you make the pinch roller angled, sorry, the form roller angled to the slip rollers. Hmm. then you can actually roll a tapered boiler. I mean, it, yes. is, quite, yes. it is quite tricky. Yeah. Hmm. You do have to keep, um, you, you have to roll it a bit and then bash the material and then roll hmm. it a bit more and then hmm. bash the material. So you, you're skewing the material round in the rollers as, you, as you're going. But it That's is right. hmm. to do a, a tapered 
a taper boiler. The hard bit about taper boilers actually is cutting out the sheet to form it because yeah. you think yes. you think that most locals, like for instance, I think LM, uh, LMS and uh, Great Western Railways were always very fond of tapered boilers, weren't they? And then latterly, um, British Railways. Mm. Um, but they're not a true cone. They're flat. They're flat, flat at the bottom, the yes. Bottom. Yes, horizontal yes, along the bottom and tapered along the top. So it's actually quite a complicated sheet that you need to cut out to form the boiler. Nightmare. It's really a job for the drawing board to start with. Well, I think I think that's the good thing about CAD, isn't it? You know, because mm. you can CAD will project the mm. Mm. shape into a into a a mask for you to cut out, aren't it? I mean, I remember my dad showed my dad's a Dad, my dad's an engineer by profession and he started in the drawing office and uh, he did once show me how to project a, 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 a boiler that wasn't a true cone onto a piece mm, of mm. silk and cut it out but I've forgotten how to do it now I'd have to go and get him to do it if I ever had to <laughs> one <laughs> it's <only> me dad <laughs> it'll cost you 20 quid an hour <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you um Yes, well, that's some, certainly. Yeah, there's some information from Brian Norris. Um, he said he's, he's obviously looked at another screen. <laughs> rollers are available on eBay for around about 117 pounds. Yeah, yeah you think, they were approximately what these cost. Yeah, if you think if you think of a price of a, you know, if you're doing two or three kits, that's not a lot of money to be spending mm -hmm. within, within yeah. the realm of spending buying kits. Um, lots, lots of kits that come have a make a virtue, don't they, of having all these parts pre-formed. <laughs> and often they're just dreadful. You, what they've actually done is turned a usable etch into scrap. You know, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, ne they very rarely bother to take off all the um, all the etching cusps before they mm. start rubbing it up. So mm. that's much more tricky, isn't it? Taking the etching cusps off something that's already formed, and um, they often look like they've been bent round a threepenny bit or something. You know, bent <laughs> over the edge of the table and. They've, they're, they're just threatening bitty and it's just not good enough that kind of thing really is it is and also to be fair if you've got a boiler that's got pre-etched holes in it for the um things like the dome or the chimney or mm. maybe the handrail knobs then you'll often find that the sheet will try to fold itself distorts along, mm. Mm. along the lines of holes you know rather than rolling itself into a nice sort of um, cylinder so I would always encourage people, you know, if I was making a kit for someone, I would always encourage the manufacturer to send me the, the wrapper not form, so at least I can do it myself. Mm. Or at least I can draw around it and cut it out, cut it out of point mm. three. You know? Yeah. Um, again, I think uh, Brian Norris says that the, the, the Midland Rail, Midland Centre may not still be trading, so that may be an issue on buying a brand new set of well, rail. I, I think Dave put an advert, didn't he, in the Gazette a couple of issues ago, and he had a photograph of all the slip rollers that he got left. And oh. Oh. A dozen sets or something like that. <laughs> but other people make them, you know. The Midland Railway Centre aren't the only people that make them. I mean, it just so happened that the ones that were on eBay were, that I bought were Midland Railway ones. I'm sure... I'm sure the other try. I've been told that you should try and get the ones that have have, have got pinch rollers, yeah. rather than the ones that have got like a pyramid, the, the where the rollers are arranged in a, a triangle, and mm. you push the middle roller down between the other two rollers to deflect the sheet. Apparently, they are not quite as um, good at forming the ends as a pinch mm. rollers. That's what mine are, and I can confirm that, Nick. Yeah, yeah. You need to pre-roll the ends first because they ping out of the slip mm. rollers. Sorry, yes. The pinch yeah. rollers don't. They ping out of the pinch rollers before all the material's gone through. That's right. So you mm. Put mm. A flat piece on the end, and to stop doing that, stop you getting that, you have to pre-roll the ends first by putting them backwards through the through the uh, rolling mm. bars. And if you if you go on YouTube. I was looking this morning, there are two or three videos that I watched this morning showing people how to use um, slip rollers, and they all pre-rolled the sheet first, all formed the, the end piece first, 
by putting it backwards through the rollers before they then start rolling the main mm. the main shape. Yeah. Okay. Uh, two, two final questions. Well, one one's information, the other one's, but uh, well, they're both information. James, no, James is asking a question. Uh, can you use a set of rollers for things like coach curved coach sides? Yes. Yeah, so um, it's not long enough. You can. <laughs> yeah. You can. You can't. Tumble homes, I think, are much more difficult to form than uh, than um, than boilers because they're a, a series of compound curves, really, aren't they? Bob Alderman, before he died, he showed me this me method he, he did for rolling coach sides where you get a, a bar like so and you tape the top of the bar to the bottom of the sheet. So if, if this drawing is the sheet, you kind of put some tape under up here and over the top of the roller and then you start here. And you have something soft underneath this, like a magazine, to press down to try and start forming that. And then what happens is the tape starts to pull the material around the bar like so. And that's how you form the tumble hole. And I thought that was a very neat trick. But I don't make coaches, mercifully. But diesels are just as difficult. I mean, I had, you know, I've made millions of steam engines. Well, not millions, maybe dozens. Um, but they're not, not anywhere near as hard as making a diesel. Diesels or electric locos are far more difficult to make because of this thing, because you have to form the cant rail, you have to form the roof, and the roof's always a series of compound curves, and they're next to impossible to form. And the thing about a diesel is, you know, it's flat surfaces with very distinct curves, and your eye spots them straight away, doesn't it, when the, when the light shines on the sky. Mm. side of the, the local and they're incredibly difficult to make much more difficult than a steam engine i mean steam engines just tubes and squares isn't it really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, there's a bit of information finally from uh from both Tim and from Mr. Faulkner, they both use G rollers from GW models. Right. Uh, okay. they, they use them both. They, they apparently go down to seven inch size version. Right. Um, and uh, they, they say they have reasonable success. Great. Great. Well, that's, that's a relief to know that when these finally die, I can go down <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. Okay, anybody well, last quickie before we wrap up. Yeah, a final question, anybody? Well, well Nick, that's that was a very, very good session. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I'm not about to rush out and roll a boiler, but if I do, I'll probably do a better job than I would have done before this session started. Um, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for all for, for viewing it. Um, remember, there's plenty more on today in, in our exhibition, so you can go off and both look at other Zoom sessions and, and layouts um, and check up on whether there's any must-haves from any traders, particularly mm -hmm. if they're doing a special offer. So thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody, for coming and listening to a covid -ed up person showing you how to run. <laughs> and... Um, um, Please, please go and enjoy the show. And maybe next time I'll show you how to make the foot plate or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks Thank very you. much, Nick. And, and thanks, Jeff, for, for your efforts as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Nick, Nick I'll, see you, I'll see you again in just before an hour's time. Yeah, yeah. Nice. I'll go and have a coffee. Thanks Bye, everybody. Everyone. Bye, everyone. I'm going to end the meeting right now.